Welcome to Forward with NACI, Inspiring Entrepreneurial Action, a podcast that shares the stories of everyday entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial leaders, and the communities that support us. We hope that this diverse collection of stories brings you inspiration, inspires you to take action, and ignites entrepreneurship in your community as we make our way forward together. Welcome to this episode of Forward with NACI. I'm Rebecca Corbin, and I'm really excited to have a special guest with us in our studio today. Um, she is the Department of Education um, Assistant Secretary, uh, Dr. Amy Lloyd, and, and she just has a wonderful story to share, and she's going to bring us up to date on some of the really impactful things that are going um, on in her area with her leadership. But um, I'm just happy to have you here with us today. and. Um, so why don't we begin and you could just introduce yourself and maybe talk a bit about your background and what led you to doing the work that you're doing today. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Corbin. And thank you to Nacy for inviting me to join you here today. I'm excited to talk with you. Uh, I am, as you said, the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education here at the U.S. Department of Education. And I have such an exciting portfolio of work that I have the honor of working with an incredible career and political team on, and that includes career and technical education, adult education, community college, and correctional education. And uh, I come at this work through um, never having served in a federal administration, certainly not at this level before, but through having worked in career-connected education, really at the intersection of education, workforce development, and economic development for decades of my career. And uh, when when you ask, like, what shaped my career trajectory or how did I come to where I am today? You know, I think about uh, I think about the importance of family. Like we we often say that family are are young people's first and most important teachers. And but that was certainly the case for me. Both of my parents are educators or were educators, and they were deeply engaged in community service and civic engagement. You know, they're the ones who are always, volunteering in literacy programs and prisons and engaging in neighborhood cleanup and uh, participating in uh, many different uh, community-driven ways of giving back. And so they were always grounded and taught me to be grounded in a uh, sense of self connected to others and, and grounded in equity and social justice. And so I, I feel like my core values of community um, have been you know, shaped by my family. And my work's always been about people as a result. Like when I was young and uh, went to college, maybe I'll back up a step and say, you know, my parents fought really hard themselves to be the first in their families to go on and earn college degrees and to uh, then become teachers themselves. They knew that education was the path to a stronger, brighter future. And they felt that for me. And yet I didn't receive a lot of career navigation and supports growing up. And I, I just knew I had to go to college. When I went off to college, I went to a four-year institution and halfway through found that I needed to take some time off both to you know earn money and you know, save for work and life and school, but also just to get my footing and make sure that I had a clear purpose and connection for my future. And so I uh, took time off from my four-year trajectory and went to two different community colleges, but that was part of my connection to people. Like the first one I went to was Northern New Mexico Community College, where I earned my EMT license and I was able to work in emergency medicine. And uh, you know, I also went to uh, Santa Fe Community College and took CTE courses and gen ed courses for uh, you know at a more affordable rate and took the long and winding road back to my four-year degree and eventually went on to earn my doctorate. But it just shows that community colleges play such a vital role in people's lives and uh, certainly did in mine, and that our pathways, whether they're educational or career pathways, are not necessarily linear. But regardless of a little bit of my long and winding road, like I, I have always been grounded in people. So I you know, worked emergency medicine, I shifted to policy and was working at the American Medical Association on international issues and ethics and ensuring the well-being of people. And then I returned to my, you know, heart and frank, frankly, my family profession, my core value of education and became a teacher and family advocate. I was the equivalent of a principal and an area superintendent working across an urban school district to ensure that students and families had voice and choice and meaningful, high quality teaching and learning opportunities. And so across my entire work trajectory, like people have always been at the center of what I do. And, uh, 
And while education serves so many different purposes for different people and different communities, like there are two core values that I really turn to when I think about my work in education. Uh, one is self-determination, which is a precept that's frankly grounded in tribal sovereignty. But I also consider what self-determination means in people's lives and in communities and how education gives people like meaningful choices about who they are and who they want to be. And I, I love that my work today, you know, allows young people and adults, students of all ages, all walks of life and their families to receive the information and the opportunities they deserve to make well-informed decisions about their, their own futures. And so self-determination is one piece. And then the other is interdependence. And I you know, really turn back to you know, my, my family on this one too, because I think about, you know, as I mentioned, like the inherent interdependence of education, workforce development, economic development, communities. But I also think about Dr. King's notion that like we're all caught up in, I think he calls it an inescapable web of mutuality. Like I can't be who I ought to be until you are who you ought to be. You can't be who you ought to be until I am who I ought to be. We're all connected and I believe our role is to help one another be our best selves. And so I've been fortunate to have not only family members, but incredible mentors who have supported me at every step in my journey to help me, you know, stay centered in who I am, where I come from, what my core values are, and then to make sure that I'm putting, you know, my values into practice through through service and through, you know, uplifting people in communities. Wow, that's, I mean, that's beautiful the way that you said that. And I think um, really, you know, your experience and the portfolio you have is um, is just perfectly matched, um, uh, you know, for what you're doing. And I think it's it's hopeful. And when I started working in the community college system 14 years ago, uh, I fell in love with it. I didn't even really realize the the impact that it could have in terms of um, impacting people at all stages of life. You know, yeah. many, you know, they wanted to take a break. They were they didn't know what they wanted to do. And and in my experience, I'm working for um, Rowan College at Burlington County um, for a number of years, in, including overseeing career services for a period of time. Um, just the welcoming nature. And, and I noticed um, as I was running the foundation that a lot of times our volunteer trustees and our faculty, um, they really made students feel like they were part of a family and it, it was special. And I I didn't feel that quite frankly when I went off to the university. I mean, I, I learned things, but I felt more like I was trying to accomplish something. And, and just the fact that community colleges have special populations offices where they they really embrace um, some of the learning differences that people have. But um, one thing you said, which I, I think is an area that that everyone is getting really interested in is really, you know, this human skills component and, and, and trying to figure out how do you better get students ready for work. And you had mentioned um, CTE um, and people who are listening to this podcast may not know what that is. So I wonder if you might um, explain, um, you know, career technical education what are the kinds of things that are included in that that area of instruction? Absolutely. Uh, CTE, known as career and technical education, is such a powerful way to help young people and ad adults alike, frankly, uh, connect with career learning that helps to supercharge their futures. Like career and technical education provides these critical opportunities for students to develop the knowledge and skills that we know are required to succeed in the world of work, to succeed in our communities and our economy. And you know, research has demonstrated again and again that CTE improves student engagement and learning because our students understand and experience firsthand like the, the why of what they're learning. Uh, when, when I was a high school teacher, I uh, taught math among other subjects, and almost every day I would hear from one student or more in my classes saying, like, why am I learning this? When am I ever going to use this? And I <laughs> wish I knew then what I know now about making real, stronger real-world connections to learning and not just learning, you know, knowledge, facts, skills, ideas, concepts in a vacuum, but really thinking about the application of, of learning and practice. So it's not just acquisition of knowledge. It's application and connection to doing. And CTE does that. So it improves academic and career outcomes. It changes lives. It strengthens communities. And there's still a lot of stigma and mindset around kind of old school, like perhaps yester century and you know, your, your grandparents' 
voc ed programs as seeing CTE as a lesser than pathway. On the contrary, CTE today is a vibrant first class, first choice opportunity for students as early as fifth grade through Perkins funding, depending on how uh, states structure their or districts structure their secondary system. Uh, Perkins funding the the is the federal funding source that funds career and technical education, and that spans secondary and post secondary education. States determine how much funding that they receive through formula based on student enrollment. They allocate to secondary versus post secondary. And in some places, you know, middle grades are a core part of, of how we fund CTE and think about CTE. However, the focus is predominantly on high school and our two-year institutions, our community and technical colleges. Um, but it, it really helps young people, in, starting as early as fifth grade or middle grades, through a two-year degree or credential, uh, engage in high-quality connections to in-demand, high-growth careers of today and of the future. It's what will you know, fuel our employer's talent pipeline needs, will help keep our nation globally competitive. But frankly, it's what gives people real opportunities to uh, exercise that self-determination, as I was speaking earlier, about who they want to be in relationship to the world of work. You know, people spend on average, like 90,000 hours at work. And that's only if you're working 40 hours a week during the typical working ages of adult life. I mean, that's a huge amount of time. And we want young people and adults alike to be able to find some purpose and connection and and joy out of what they do during their professional world, um, during their professional lives. And CTE helps to, to connect that sense of purpose and joy and career much earlier than you know when a young person hits the world of work. And I'm, uh, so, I'm so happy to hear you talk about joy. It's it's funny. We're at my organization, NACI, we're just getting ready to advertise for three leadership positions because we're growing and scaling. Yeah. That was one of the things that I wrote in um, my letter is that I want people that will come to NACI and have that spirit of joy and curiosity and discovery. And as yes. I was writing, I was like, I don't know if that's like appropriate, but it, it's like a sign from the universe. You're telling me, yes, that that's right. And I want to um, ask you a little bit too. I think you did a great job in explaining CT, especially um, really being a passionate advocate for it. And um, even if you look at, at salaries of jobs, um, it, it, they tend to outpace other kinds of professions when people get into them. But I'd, I'd love to just build on what you said a little bit and um, share with you some of the work that NACI's doing um, in the maker uh, movement. So, oh, you know, making, I think your example of when you were a teacher is like, why do I have to learn algebra? When am I ever going to learn? When am I ever going to use this? And one experience that I had um, several years ago, we were at a, a Fab Lab conference and we had, um, it was high school teachers and community college teachers and we were in this space where it was, you know, there were sewing machines and there were, um, you know, 3D printers and things like that. And one of the teachers said, this is how I got the young men predominantly that couldn't pass um, developmental math to pass it because they wanted to learn how to build an Adirondack chair. And the only way you can do that is really having a very basic understanding of algebra. And it was like an aha moment. They they had to learn it because they they really were focused on making their chair. And and I as you were talking about that, I'd forgotten about that memory. But yes. um I, I just love to hear it. I know we have other things we want to talk about, but just you know, what what's your thinking about like making that connection, like making it matter? And have you have you had any um kind of experiences um with uh, making and and how do you see that? Oh I I love maker spaces and fab labs are, you know, one of you know, many great ways that that young people and adults can can see that spark and see that why. And so I like what you just shared about that young man finally like having it the spark go off saying, oh, I need this because I want to do this thing um, is exactly what we want all students to experience. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a step back and say beyond career and technical education, which you know, provides specific programming in secondary and post-secondary. Our Secretary of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, wants to reimagine high school writ large. And, and we just launched a new initiative called uh, Unlocking Career Success, Raise the Bar, Unlocking Career Success around career and college pathways, because we want all students, not just those who are in high quality CTE programs to experience this kind of powerful career connected, you know, joyful sparked why of learning. 
And uh, I know your audience is predominantly community colleges. Frankly, we need community colleges to be at the center of this work. Um, and so when we're thinking about career pathways and what we want to do in raising the bar for the educational experience we want young people to have, there are four core areas that we know we want every young person in our ideal world to have. So if I could wave a magic wand and leverage the incredible disruption the pandemic has has had on our education system and use that disruption to transform the business of schooling, I would ensure that every single student graduates high school with college credit work-based learning, an industry credential, and powerful, personalized career advising and navigation supports. And um, if I can just take a moment and kind of go through each of those things, when we think about career and college pathways, like we want students to take dual enrollment classes in both core academic content, their gen ed, so that they don't get stuck in developmental math, um, so they don't get stuck in developmental you know, English, but instead are able to earn their first English and math class while in high school through partnerships with community colleges and break those cycles of needing developmental education, which we know too often results in, in students not attaining their post-secondary degree or credential. But it also means students taking a couple of classes from community colleges, array of you know exciting CTE courses or career-connected offerings. And then on the work-based learning front, you know, I think about how important it is to have that hands-on learning, such as you know, maker spaces or fab labs, but also through internships and apprenticeship and other forms of on-the-job education and training. And the secretary envisions how we you know, activate local and regional and frankly state kind of ecosystems in which our high schools and our community colleges are working together to create a continuum of work-based learning experiences for students to engage in that like really important real world application of knowledge and skills, like I was saying, um, and also how community colleges and high schools could together engage business and industry as partners. Because we know if we're thinking about building powerful career pathways, we have to reverse engineer them from where business and industry is, where it's going, where we want to grow important sectors to our economy and ensure that employers are key partners along the way. And that's you know why we really care about industry sought credentials, not just those that are industry recognized. There are a million credentials out there that most of which employers recognize, but we want the ones that employers are putting in their job descriptions that are proxies for skills that they seek in their workers. And we need our community colleges to work with our high schools and with our employers to make sure that as we're building in industry credentials that into programs of study that span grades nine through 14, that they are stackable and portable and latticeable and integrated into programs of study. And so community colleges are really at the hub there. And then when it comes down to like the personalized career advising and information that we know students and families deserve, like this is about, again, the self-determination to clarify their career and college dreams, to build a real plan to meet those dreams and receive support throughout high school and community college to make those dreams a reality. Oh, I think that's so well said. And as you were talking about the secretary and, and the work that you all are doing together, it it really is is all about entrepreneurial mindset. It's looking yes. at assets and, and agency so that people can start to think about, you know, the impact. And it doesn't matter where you start from, where you could advance and really um, government and um, business and, and education working um, just hand in glove. So it's it's so exciting. Um and I know as our time is winding short, there was one other um, area that I wanted to talk with you about because, you know, my experience with community colleges, one thing that I was very impressed with is their commitment to um, serving um, people uh, who were in uh, incarcerated situations or coming out of that. And, and I know for me personally, I learned a lot about um, how that really helps communities on multiple levels. And I know that's something that is important to this administration. So maybe you could talk a little bit about why is, uh, you know, what what the um, Department of Education is focusing on um, within the correctional area and why it's so important to communities? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Correctional education is a vital part of our uh, our nation's well-being, frankly. And two of the secretary's priorities are, like, on the one hand, making higher education more inclusive and affordable, and on the other hand, ensuring that our pathways through higher education lead to successful careers. And both of these priorities are exemplified by our administration's work in correctional education. So one branch of that are is the second chance Pell programs, 
Um, we currently have nearly 200 second chance Pell sites in which students who are incarcerated are engaging in you know, really exciting college learning funded by Pell Grants. And we're going to uh, work towards the full reinstatement of Pell Grants for people who are incarcerated starting next July. And uh, on the Second Chance Pell experimental sites, like that's demonstrated to us that our community colleges, our universities, our correction systems can work together to really transform our prison system and transform outcomes for the students that we serve over the past five years in this Almost 30,000 students have accessed Pell Grants through Second Chance Pell, and they've pursued powerful post-secondary education while in prison. Over 9,000 of them have earned an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree or a certificate or diploma. And like this work isn't just about the numbers. It's about changing the lives of our students and their families and bringing dignity and purpose and hope into our nation's prisons. Uh, I am really excited about how we're thinking about correctional education writ large. So with the full reinstatement of Pell Grants next year, that's going to be an important piece. But we also need to recognize that disproportionately um, people who are incarcerated also need support in adult basic education and attaining their high school equivalency and having powerful career and technical education uh, opportunities for them. And so we're thinking through the whole array of integrated education and training opportunities, on ramps into post-secondary education so that people who are incarcerated can experience the, you know, the value and the dignity of learning and then post-release have connections, have career opportunities, have impact on their families and communities to engage and give back and, you know, have a bright future thanks to the education that they sought and attained while behind bars. That said, I recently visited an um, institution in which most of the people who were incarcerated were either incarcerated for long terms or for life. And even for uh, people who do not have release near on their horizon, education plays a powerful role in transforming the culture of prison settings, of um, ensuring that people have that purpose, have that interdependence, have that self-determination, even within the context of being incarcerated. And so I see tremendous value both in kind of the short-term, close-to-release educational programs for people to then have ripple effects back into you know, their uh, re-entry process, but also for people who are facing longer sentences, it provides value and connection and purpose and stability and safety and wellness for the entire prison community. So investing in correctional education is investing in kind of the the strength and the belief uh, in a brighter future for for the millions of people who uh, this kind of work impacts. Yeah, indeed. And I think that's really the humanity. And, yeah. you know, it's it's just, to me, I, I think it's, it's hopeful because I think ultimately as community members and, you know, parents and people that care about um, others, you know, we want to keep people safe. And the way to do it is have people give them something to live for and make yes. all of the People who work in those institutions have a higher quality of life because I think um, what what we've seen, you know, in terms of, of some of the community colleges that get engaged in that work, there's the added benefit for women who are incarcerated that, you know, this could be the opportunity that they could reconnect um, with their children, but but sort of relearn a, a different way, which really impacts families. So I, I want to thank you and your for your leadership and what all of you are doing. And I know um, all of our listening audience, we have community college um, uh, folks that listen, but we, we're now in over 800 cities, American cities and 51 countries around the world. So there might be people that don't realize some of the, the wonderful things that are going on. So um, yeah, I just want to thank you for, for everything that you shared. If people want to learn more about what's going on in any of these programs, how do they, how do they find that out? Um, what, what website would they go to the U.S. Uh, Department of Education website? Yes. So uh, you can go to the U.S. Department of Education website, which is ed.gov. If you okay. want to learn more about career technical education in particular, cte.ed.gov. Okay. Uh, and I would welcome any sort of follow-up or questions that your listeners may have. And I, a very quick note, you mentioned women who are incarcerated in particular. I, I attended a, a graduation ceremony at a women's correctional facility recently and was in the audience talking to their children and their grandchildren who were so proud. In fact, I talked to one teenage boy who said, 
okay, so my mom says since she's graduating from college, I now have to go and graduate from college too. And we looked up the her mom's name on the list. She had an asterisk by her name, which meant she was on the dean's list. Mm -hmm. And then I pointed that out to him and, with, you know, he just was so proud and the intergenerational impact that correctional education can have on families and on communities and, you know, the extending influence and impact it has on people's lives is tremendous. So um, very much a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. And also just a very much a big believer in community colleges. I know our time is short. I just want to say, like, I am all in on lifting, as is the president and our secretary Cardona, lifting up the role of community colleges, because ultimately, you know, they are lifelines to opportunity for our rural students, for students of color, for our students from low-income backgrounds or who are juggling work and family and life beyond school. Like, they really are, I, I often think of them as power hubs into which you know lots of different entities plug in to power up. So whether it's reach back to K-12 and helping high school students, whether it's working with business and industry or transfer to four-year, whether it's partnering with community-based organizations, and I think about you know, two thirds of our community colleges being in rural areas and really truly being the heart and hub of rural communities. Like I have such hope and belief and optimism about the power of our nation's community colleges to really you know, transform lives and strengthen you know, our, our future. So I'm very excited to talk with your audience more about community colleges should they wish to reach out. Well, that's beautifully said. And I just encourage everyone who's listening, if uh, you, you know, you can volunteer to, you know, serve on an advisory board at a community college. You can take yes. a class no matter how old, how young. Um, and, you know, people need mentors. So, so that to me has always been the open access. Everyone is invited. So thank you so much, um, uh, Assistant Secretary Amy Lloyd. I hope you have a wonderful day. I know you've made my day um, just having this conversation. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again. You bet.